And now we're going to have a slight change of tack. Um, there's been a lot of focus on neuroscience today, uh, but immunology is also, of course, a very important component of IMI, and there are already four um, consortia working in the immunology area, and I believe immunology is going to be an important part of the next call. And we are very privileged to have Professor Rolf Sinkenagel with us today. Uh, Professor Zinkenagel was one of the 1996 Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine. He was awarded the Nobel Prize together with Peter Doherty for working out how the body recognizes virus-infected cells. And he's now going to give a talk on immun immunity versus immunological memory. And afterwards, there will be a chance for a Q&A. I think probably we can all go and sit back in the audience. And I'll hand over to Professor Zinkenagel. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here and to talk to you about um, immunity in a very general way. Where do I come from? I'm an MD who started as a surgeon, so I like to have my hands on and in. Now, doing and teaching to the students, teaching textbook knowledge, you very easily observe how many things are actually wrong or don't make sense in the textbooks. So roughly about half what is reported to IMI1, but also half what is reported in textbooks is probably wrong. We just don't know which half. And of course, that is the basic and important problem we all face in so-called research. And in your program, you of course want to amalgamate basic with so-called applied or useful research, and we all know, as defined by the president of the US Academy of Sciences, that basic research is just not yet applied research. So it's a long-term investment, and we, of course, would like to live up to our promises. And I think that's another very important problem, that we make false promises. Not only politicians, also scientists often make wrong promises. And we do not get punished for that. Therefore, the half-life of a politician is about four years, as we all know. Therefore, by the time you should come up with the goods, the politician is away and can't remember. So it's very important that we are not making excessive promises, and the same is, of course, true for the industry. However, the pharmaceutical industry gets punished because if something doesn't work, the industry goes down the drain. And I think that is the good thing about combining the two uh, in one general problem, uh, program. Now, I'd like to illustrate some of these very general points by um, going into vaccines. Because the vaccines also illustrate the very important shortcoming of all research programs that at the end of the day, the most efficient way to change costs in medicine would actually be to change behavior. But this, of course, is even much more difficult than to enhance or improve research. And vaccines is, again, a very good point. As you see, there are vaccines that are extremely efficient. There are all the vaccines against classical childhood infections. And these are all infections that basically kill you in seven to 10 days. We do not have vaccines against chronic types of infections that only kill you in 10 or 30 years. And there's a fundamental difference between these two kinds of infections. And um, I'll try to illustrate that uh, in this rather um, short slide. 
Immunity that is resistance against acute killing infections is guaranteed by innate resistance, and this is about 95% of all resistance. Specific immunity is just the frosting on the cake, the 5% on top. That in the specific immunity, very important, is, for example, illustrated in the chicken's egg, because there you know that there's a huge depot of maternal antibodies that goes with the unborn chicken. And the same actually is true in humans and mice. And it is the maternal antibody that protects the not yet born, but then the newborn against all the epidemiologically important infections, showing that the only thing that matters is really antibody. I'll talk about the cell-mediated immunity and why we do not have a vaccine that uses T cells to protect. And the best example, of course, is tuberculosis. Most, or at least half, of uh, the members of this audience have a tuberculosis granuloma. So they have an infection, but they are not sick with TB. Why is that? Because the very efficient immune response against TB keeps the infection at one small site, usually in the lung. And it is that lesion with living bacteria that actually continuously keeps the immune response going. So in a way you could say wild type tuberculosis is the best vaccine against disease by tuberculosis. But that's not our usual understanding of a vaccine. Vaccine should prevent infection and cause a sterile status against that infection. But this is not true. And the term immunity actually is much less precise than we usually like to use immunology. Immunity simply means we are resistant against disease. Now, it's interesting that most of the diseases against which we are rather powerless is actually our diseases that hit us after 30 years of age. And this includes autoimmune diseases, all forms of cancer, uh, so it's chronic degenerative types of diseases. And there is a reasonable consensus that uh, for most of these diseases, some sort of form of infection are actually etiological um, at the beginning of these chronic processes. But they kill us only after the age of 30, usually after 40 or 50, and therefore such events have no evolutionary consequences. Because up till very recently, women had their first child, children at 12 or 15, then had to rise them for six or seven or eight years, make, brings them up to 22, and after that, our human biology is at the end. All the rest of our joys of living and surviving disease is basically evolutionary luxury. It's like an old car. Once you have achieved 75,000 kilometers, you know, things start to fall apart. With humans, it's about 25 to 30. Not mo most people don't like that analogy, but that's, biologically, that's the truth. Same, to, of course, for tumors. Now, if we look at infectious diseases then, and this is my introduction into immunology, um, rather simplistic, you have basically two types of problems. Either a virus or bacterium or parasite infects a cell or a host, and there are two outcomes. Either the virus destroys the host cell and releases new virus, or the virus does nothing to the physiology of the cell. Now, this, of course, is the case of the acute childhood infections. They kill you in seven to 10 days, and therefore their specific immunity is important. As you all know, polio one, two, and three. If you are immune against polio one, you are not resisting polio two or three. 
So there's a high component, very important component of specific immunity. And therefore, it is this type of immunity that is important, like against polio 1, because these antibodies basically cover up the viral particle and prevent the virus to hit the next cell to make another uh, round of amplification. Now, these types of infections actually would not need an immune response simply because the virus does not, or the infection, doesn't cause the death of the patient. In fact, in these types of infections, it is not the virus that kills the host cell. It could potentially be the immune response recognizing that the host cell is infected because the immune system cannot distinguish between cytopathic cell destructive versus non-cytopathic virus. To avoid that, these types of infections jump from a virus or infection carrying host to the next susceptible host at or even before birth. Why is that? With a small transfusion of maternal blood, this infection is simply handed down to the newborn. And this works because the newborn at the time of birth has no functioning immune system. Therefore, you avoid this damaging immune response. And in fact, most of these infections are handed down from a virus carrying mother to the offspring before or at birth. Now, there is a, an important additional point I want to make, and that is that viruses, bacteria, and parasites all have one thing in common. They have on their outer envelope or surface a multima, many identical structures that are pointed out, outwards towards the immune antibodies or T cells, and these structures on the envelope are all identical and only show in a way like my fingertips if you put the fingers together. And the antibody structure, which is about the size of my right hand, simply are too big for these antibodies to be squeezed into these structures. So the immune system for these acute childhood infections only sees actually the tips of the fingers. So there's only one determinant, so to say, that is shown on the outside of these infections. And that's why these neutralizing antibodies are so efficient, because they simply cover things up. But all the rest of the virus or the bacterium are almost the same amongst the various so-called serotypes, like polio 1, 2, 3, share almost everything else except for the tip. But that shows that the tip of these viruses, bacteria, and so on, is the key to protection. Now, if we look at the immune response against a virus, in this case, it's like a rabies virus or an influenza virus, you see that over time, the virus replicates, you make a T cell response, and you make antibodies of two qualities. If you like to use so-called ELISA assays, which is basically sticking virus or bacteria antigens onto plastic, that is, you denature them, you make them artificial, and you look how many antibodies can bind to that antigen on plastic, then you find the response is prompt, very early, day two, three, four, and goes very high up. But you are not, as a medico, you are only interested in protection. Therefore, you measure neutralizing capacity, that is, protective capacity. Also, for these acute killing viruses, this response is extremely prompt. Within four to five days, this response is up. But now look at infections of the hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, malaria type. They have a completely distinct kinetics. The parasite grows, you have a T cell response, you have a very early, very efficient ELISA response. But you are not interested in ELISAs, you are interested in neutralization or protection. And there it takes between 80 and 300 days to come up with that protective 
antibody response. And what happens by that time? All these viruses, parasites, have a mutational process that changes their fingertips continuously in periods of 10 to 30 to 50 days. So by the time this slow neutralizing antibody response comes up, the virus or the parasite has disappeared from that immune response by a long way. So the immune response always is far way behind the mutability and changeability of the parasite. And that's why, very simply, that's why we do not have a vaccine. And that's why I think it's almost impossible to develop a vaccine, because even had you a vaccine against one determinant, thing of the determinants, the virus that infects you is unlikely to be of that type, or if it were, it simply mutates away. So, I mean, to hope for a vaccine is one thing. To deliver a vaccine is quite a distinct thing. And to tell politicians that the HIV vaccine or the, you know, the Gates Foundation, that the HIV vaccine is available in two years, that was in the 1980s, in five years, that's now, is simply an illusion for that simple reason that these viruses and these types of infections have co-evolved and coexisted with higher vertebrates, and that's us, you know, for so long that the game sort of has settled into a mutual cat and hide type of coexistence that doesn't kill the host and doesn't kill the parasite too efficiently. And that's why these things last for 20, 30, 40 years. Now, let's look at something more constructive. This example, where some antibodies that are not protective come up very early, but the protective one take 80 to 300 days, obviously could be used as a new vaccine carrier. You know, we all think about new vaccine carriers, like recombinant vaccine virus, where you take a good vaccine, but insert these fingertips of other viruses into that vaccine virus and use that as a vaccine. That's fine for the first time. But the second time, you can't use it any longer. Why? Because you have made antibodies that prevent the next vaccine virus with another insert to actually grow in you, and therefore you have destroyed this capacity. But in this case, you have a chance, you see, because now you have a vaccine carrier, which is, of course, not through regulatory affairs yet, but you have a potential carrier against which you do not make neutralizing or protective antibodies. And we, in fact, and this is Donny Pinchhaver in the lab with some collaborators, we have tested this, and we have made a crippled virus into which Instead of the viral glycoprotein, we now set in other genes for these fingertips. Immunize. Immunize a second time, and you see the efficacy is about the same. If you take a recombinant adenovirus or vaccine virus, the first time it works, second time, zilch. So here we could learn from co-evolution and use the trick of evolution to maybe come up and develop something that so far has not been used, neither in the lab nor in industry, but has been used for thousands, if not millions of years in this establishment of a interesting balanced situation. Now, in textbooks in immunology, you always find that vaccine protection is due to the system's capacity to have a memory. So you vaccinate once, and your system remembers. Because, as you all know, our brain memory should do the same. But with age, of course, 
this dwindles and wanes, and the same is true with immunological memory. Actually, the titers go down. So, definition of this memory is quicker and higher. You immunize, you get a response, antibodies, neutralization. Then you come a second time, you get a quicker response, a steeper increase, and a higher response. This works very nicely against smallpox, polio, measles, but it doesn't work against these infections, and I've just explained why. Now, if you measure so-called memory, that is quicker and higher, and you do that with ELISA, then you find that these responses, in fact, have a long duration. This is mouse work, so 300 days for a mouse is pretty good. But the neutralizing, the protecting antibodies actually fall below detectable protective levels by 30 to 50 days. So there is no real memory. Let's do a simple experiment. We take a mouse, we vaccinate it against a rabies-like virus, and then we take the so-called memory T cells and B cells, those make antibodies, those make the cell-mediated immunity, and we put these memory T and B cells into a naive recipient. And then we challenge this naive recipient, all mice die. So where is the memory? Because we have transferred so-called memory T and B cells. Now, instead of taking the memory cells of the immune system, you simply take the blood from that donor mouse. Transfer the blood to a naive recipient, and now times everybody is protected. And this, of course, is an experiment you all have lived through. Namely, at our birth, we all got from our mother a high amount of immunoglobulin, that is antibodies, of all the diseases the mother had survived before. And had she not survived these diseases, particularly these acute killing infections, she could not have become pregnant, of course, because she would have been dead before. So why should we simply question, you know, ingrown toenails, beliefs, dogmas in, in the textbooks. And immunologic memory, memory, of course, is such a dogma, simply because it doesn't make sense. So, if, if immunological memory, you know, is necessary, uh, then we can ask the following question. If the first infection kills you, you certainly don't need memory after that. <laughs> if you survive the first infection, that of course shows that the system is fit for you to survive the next time as well. So the question really is, you know, what is, the, what is that all about, so-called memory? Now, it's very interesting in humans, but mice, many species, and in ruminants, there are two interesting solutions to the problem that we are all born without a functioning immune system. And the reason for that is, of course, complex, but the fetus should not reject the mother, and the mother should not reject the fetus, because it's basically a foreign graft. So let's look at it in humans and mice, the mother's side is simply a, a lake of blood. And in that blood, there are many antibodies of the mother. And on the fetus's side, there is one membrane. And in this membrane, there are receptors where the immunoglobulin of, of the mother can be hooking in, transported across the membrane, and within the last trimester, the fetus is full of maternal antibodies itself, the fetus cannot make immune antibodies. In calves, it's even more extreme because the calves and all ruminants have two complete membrane sets between mother and offspring. There are no transport mechanisms that can transgress two complete membrane systems. 
And therefore, the, feet, the calf is born without a functioning immune system and without maternal immunoglobulin. That's why we all use fetal calf serum in the laboratory, because we don't want the adverse action of these unknown antibodies in the serum. So the calf is born without maternal antibodies, without a functioning system, and should not die. The solution in this case by evolution is that in the gut of the calf there are these same receptors, but now on gut epithelial cells, and within the first 18 hours after birth, the calf has to consume the first maternal milk, which is col called colostrum, which is a concentrate of antibodies of maternal origin. And these maternal antibodies now are being taken up via these gut FC receptors, and within 18 hours, the levels of immunoglobulin in the calf are full filled to the brim. After 18 hours, the half-life of the renewal of the epithelial cells is such that the upcoming new epithelial cells don't express these FC receptors, and therefore no antibodies are, can be taken up. So everything happens in these first 18 hours. Two completely distinct solutions with the same result. The offspring is born with high levels of epidemiological experience immunologically of the mother. And it is that mortgage of the mother handed down that guarantees survival. So let's look at this situation. You have mother AB, father CD. So the offspring being AC, let's take, is a foreign graft in the mother. That's why pregnant mothers are slightly immunosuppressed. But in addition, on the outer membranes of the fetus, there is no transplantation antigen expressed. So for the mother, it's like a neutral graft. The offspring, of course, is AC, could attack the B of the mother. Therefore, the offspring is immunoincompetent. And the antibodies are handed down from the mother to the offspring, and the offspring is born with maternal antibodies. If the mother hadn't made good antibodies against virus X, then that vi virus X would have killed the mother and the fetus during pregnancy, of course. So all these experiments have to be before pregnancy, which basically means be 12, before 12 years, and that's why we call them childhood infections. So born with the maternal antibodies, now exposed to virus X, the offspring is protected by the maternal antibodies, of course. But eventually, these antibodies will go down. So after some time, the virus X will not be completely neutralized, or only partially neutralized. And therefore, there will be active infection with immunization, because by that time, the immune system in the offspring has matured and has become competent. So it's a sort of a, a nice balance, first complete protection, then partial protection, then the infection is attenuated, and that then causes an infection that immunizes, and basically we do the same with all the su su successful vaccines. The pediatricians, of course, notice that if you vaccinate too early with the vaccine X, it's the maternal antibodies that actually neutralize or eliminate the vaccine, and therefore there will be no protection. So they simply said, and this is most of medicine, it's very practical. Instead of only vaccinating once, you do it three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, maybe five years, and that spreads the odds of maternal antibodies inactivating the vaccine very practically. Now, just look at this part of the panel. The baby with the antibody is born, but is raised in an environment without exposure to infectious diseases. The maternal antibodies will, will fade away, and if the first exposure comes at five years or eight years, primary school, for example, then there is no attenuation by the maternal antibodies. What happens? It's a wild-type infection that could kill now the growing up infant. 
And this is exactly what happened in the 50s with polio. Suddenly, something that was almost without clinical consequences epidemiologically turned into a sort of an epidemic simply because the first exposure was delayed beyond the attenuating um, time frame of the antibody. Okay, now, you may have read in the newspapers, but in Nature and Science, this is all questionable. We simply promise a simple, unique, all protective vaccine against HIV, despite what I've said against all these variations of the fingertips, and the same, of course, against influenza. Because one of the big problems with influenza is each year we have to predict what the next influenza virus might be that comes up and makes us sick. And therefore, instead of showing the fingertip configuration, these authors like to draw things differently. You see, they only, instead of showing this quite repetitive alignment with these simply structural restraints that nothing can go in between, they simply draw only one of these units and now say, well, you know, it's okay, some of these determinants are up here at the fingertip, but we have common and constant determinants at the stalk region. Therefore, we must make a vaccine against these common determinants in the stalk region, and this will protect against all the variants. But of course, this will not happen simply because the construction of the virus is of this type. That is, these antibodies against these parts simply cannot reach these common determinants. So, good thinking, but it's dirty ideas. It will not work, it cannot work, because evolution has exactly for that reason jumped around and modulated only these fingertips at the outermost portion of the viral surface. So, can we do something about it? Well, let's take the influenza situation, of course. There are probably about between 300 and 1,000 different influenza viruses. Each year, only one or two maybe hit us. So make, let's make a vaccine with 1,000 or 500 components. Simply a gemisch of all these viruses and say each year we come back with the vaccine and should protect against everything and therefore we should be immune against everything. But of course this is rather difficult to get through regulatory agencies because now you have a thousand component type of vaccine, not just a one or three component vaccine. But maybe that's something one should try out. And the same of course with HIV. Only for HIV it's not 300 to 1,000 different fingertip types. It's probably 100,000 to a million variations. So not, not really reducing the problem. So what are my conclusions? Memory is a nice idea, but it's basically a laboratory artifact. It works in the lab, of course. You can publish many papers, but it has no real importance for protective immunity under epidemiological situa situations. And the only guiding predictor is the pre-existing titer of neutralizing protective antibodies. There is no other correlate to protection. And the important thing is that these antibody titers must be driven by antigen re-exposure. There are various possibilities. Either the antigen persists in the host, that's actually true for measles, or we re-vaccinate in three to five year cycles, particularly um, mothers or future mothers, because there it's particularly important to keep the antibodies high, uh, or the infectious agent 
simply persists in the host and drives, continuously drives this immune response. I've mentioned tuberculosis or leprosy as excellent examples. So, practical medicine is not an easy thing. Intelligent thinking helps, money helps, but I think a healthy critical mind in not just basing one's thinking on established half knowledge or textbooks, but thinking about the disease process is at least as important as intelligence and money. And therefore, I think it's good to have programs like yours because in the end, you can't end with the promises. You have to come up with something that works. And medicine is simple. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Michelle, do we have time for a few questions? If you're ha would you be happy to answer some? Okay. I have a first question. All these science and nature authors, you make a very convincing case about memory. Do you think they believe what they're saying when they make these promises? Well, you see, that's where, where things become a bit more complicated. If the Bill Gates Foundation, or by the way, the Wellcome Foundation, says, you know, we give Bill Gates a quarter of our HIV budget is for vaccines. You know, wouldn't, couldn't you get motivated to put in a grant saying you would make a vaccine against HIV? Fair enough. <laughs> but how depressing. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Michel. We have a workshop to possibly design a new IMI project on correlate of protection for flu vaccine. So what you, would be your recommendation as far as correlative protections are concerned? You see, influenza is a bit more complicated for the following reason. The standard assay for neutralization is actually hemagglutination inhibition, which is not quite a neutralization assay. Therefore, we should improve on a better test, although hemagglutination inhibition is a fair approximation, but it's not a good test. So that's where I would put my money. Thank you. <laughs> so that, that solves your problem too. <laughs> anybody, no, no, not sure. <laughs> anybody else got a challenge they need solved? It's <laughs> Yes, please, the question in the back. This is only a curiosity. Uh, you have said that the colostrum of the cows uh, have, uh, are very high in uh, antibodies and are very good for the, the calves. It's the same with the colostrum of the humans. I tell you why I say, because in, in an old tradition in, in my country of origin, they say it was very important for the babies to drink the, the colostrums and they were wonderful, so I wonder. Yes, you see, in humans, the situation a bit is different because you get all the serum antibodies before via the placenta. But once the placenta is gone, you know, you can't get that any longer. But all your gut antibodies that you get via mother's milk actually control or balance your flora, which is, of course, very important because babies you know, losing liquid is some of the worst things that can happen. And therefore, the mother's milk is actually the key factor
to control diarrheal diseases in, let's say, for the first six to 12 months. So that's the key. And to just take that a step further, you know, there are many diarrheal diseases that have some connection or implication for later degenerative types of chronic inflammatory diseases. Therefore, one could easily argue, and I like to argue that way, that if you control the early balance, similar to the ceramide uh, antibodies and certain neurological infections like measles or polio, you will have as a concrete benefit that these chronic types of infections and inflammations get pushed to a later age and therefore you avoid these immunopathologies for a longer time. Another comment here. Microphone, please. Is there a microphone? Oh, I'll bring one. Yeah, thank you. I would like to know about coal evolution. What do you think about phages to fight against bacteria as multi-resistant? Yes, you see, uh, the phages idea has been around now for 70 or so years. It's an example of the things that, you know, is a good idea, but the clinical results so far are absolutely disappointing. It's zero. So, you know, you can say it's not impossible, but it looks highly unlikely. I agree with you because they've been fighting each other for billions of years, you know, and they're still there. So we have to change maybe to create banks of phages to fight. <laughs> Thank you. Last question, please. So um, in your talk, you spoke mainly about the prophylactic vaccine. So I would like to have your opinion about the validity of the concept of therapeutic vaccine, especially in the field of cancer, because you spoke a little bit. Is it valid for you or not? No, no. You see, cancer is an interesting problem, of course, because solid peripheral cancers like the carcinomas and the sarcomas behave in a way like our endocrine organs. Take islets of Langerhans producing insulin. They are embedded in the pancreas. They are like, you know, small little tumors. We don't make an immune response against these islets. Why? Because there's no reason. They always stay out of the immune system. So do the growing small carcinomas and sarcomas. You know, they are in the big toe, let's say, far away from everything, far away from the immune system. And therefore, by the time these tumors are big enough to start decaying because of oxygenation problems and all sorts of vascularization problems. When the material gets into lymph nodes or spleen, the train has left the station. It's too late because the problem is too big. Do you know one gram of tumor, which is a cubic, a sugar cube of tumor cells, is 10 to the nine tumor cells. And clinically, this is a tumor that most of the time is never seen because it's too small. But this is already immunologically a huge problem. That's why I wanted to become a surgeon, you see, because you can cut out the stuff. Very efficient. <laughs> but does, that, does that answer your question?